Welcome, everybody. My name's Ben Bidknand, and I'm the Senior Director of Precincts and Government here at Monash University. And I'd like to start by acknowledging that we meet on the land of the Kulin Nations and to acknowledge uh, Elders past and present. Um, I'd also like to welcome uh, our commissioners that have come here uh, for, for the week, actually, uh, for a series of events uh, to discuss the role of intermediary cities and how that fits into innovation, precincts, precincts and ecosystems. Uh, Julie has come from, from Switzerland uh, as one of the commissioners, but we do have four, four commissioners in the audience. So I'll just ask uh, our four commissioners, Ken, Keys, uh, Chris and Genoa, to stand up so everyone can see you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll have um, some refreshments afterwards and you'll have the opportunity to, uh, to meet and chat with these commissioners as well. Um, just like to acknowledge Natalie and Darren who are here who are part of the Commission Secretariat as well and uh, have helped pull the work together uh, over a period of time, particularly through COVID uh, time when the Commission report was, uh, was developed. So a lot of work and a lot of uh, uh, running around. So acknowledge the Commissioners and the, and the Secretariat that have done all the work. Um, Mark Birrell, who is the Commission Chair, uh, is not here today, but he will be joining us throughout the week. So just acknowledging uh, Mark Birrell as well. Uh, so today we'll have, um, you know, without the without the fire, the fireside chat, of course, um, series of Q and A's that I'll pose to both uh, to, to Julie and Duron, um, and then we'll throw it open for some uh, audience questions as well. So please be thinking of any questions that you'd you'd like to raise. We've got the Twitter hashtags and handles uh, up above. So uh, by all means, if you, as you're live tweeting, please use uh, that information and also the Commission website where you can download a report if you, uh, if you haven't received one yet. Um, but we also do have some reports uh, just outside, uh, outside the door, so you can grab one on the way out. Anybody needing to use the bathrooms, they're on the other side of this ground floor lobby, so uh, please feel free to do that as, as need be. Uh, and I think we'll get we'll get going, and I'll do the introductions uh, to start off with. So uh, Julie is the um, president of the Global Institute of Innovation Districts, which Monash is a member of, and is also a senior fellow at Brookings Institute with a long history of writing and researching about uh, innovation districts and innovation precincts. So it's been a wonderful contributor to the uh, Monash Commission report, and also the work that we've been doing here in the Monash uh, Technology Precinct. So welcome, Julie. And Duron is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Enterprise Engagement at Monash University. He has over 30 years experience uh, in venture capital, uh, CEO and board chair activity, looking at the translation of research, uh, how the translation and innovation research can move into commercialisation and helping to guide firms through those opportunities or indeed starting his own businesses and, uh, and doing that work. So we've got a great panel here to discuss um, how intermediary cities work drawing on some of the conclusions and the learnings from the Monash Commission report and then bringing it down to what exactly is happening in and around uh, us at the Monash Technology Precinct. So Julie, I might start with you just to give us an overview of what is the Global Institute of Innovation Districts, just so the audience can hear uh, how that fits into the big picture of our discussions today. Sure. So the Global Institute, is this on? Do you hear yeah. me? Okay. Uh, it's an independent research organization. It's a not-for-profit. It's global reaching, and it actually builds on the research that I co-authored with Bruce Katz called The Rise of Innovation Districts, which we published in 2014. What we quickly realized when we wrote that report is the resounding energy enthusiasm on the ground in cities all around the world to learn more about this emerging model of innovation, place-based innovation. And so this conversation led with conversations at the Brookings Institution to say, let's have a dedicated research organization focused exclusively on this model. And so came from that discussion, came the, the Global Institute on Innovation Districts. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. So Building on that, what role do innovation districts play in building a cohesive and prosperous society? They can play a very central role, but it does require real leadership and intentionality. The vast majority of innovation districts actually begin quite organically. They are centered around R&D strong and robust institutions, so universities, medical institutions that then see the opportunity to look at and create something much larger than themselves. 
So there's this organic set of circumstances that starts to say there's something bigger here. That's when the enlightenment intentionality starts to kick in. So if you're thinking about how to create an innovative and inclusive future, that actually means you need to build that in into your agenda right from the very beginning. And believe it or not, as perhaps boring or maybe exciting, depending on your view, it actually comes down to how you organize yourself, how you govern and structure yourself that will define your ability to reach a social, equitable, and innovative outcome. And so, Duran, thinking about some of those concepts around governing and, and organizing in order to deliver outcomes, what are some of the drivers that you're looking to implement and build on here in the Monash Technology Precinct? Yeah, so f firstly, let me say uh, it's, it's great to have the commissioners here that worked on this report. It's, uh, it's a great report. Those that haven't had a chance to read it, please, please do, and lovely to see Julie again. Um, I think the, the opportunity for us is to uh, recognise that as a, as a research and teaching institution, which is our, that's our core business, that's what we do, um, our job is to optimise the way in which we do our core business, just like any other business's job is to optimise their operations, which means we want to do the best research and the best teaching we possibly can. To do that, we need to avail ourselves of all the resources the world has to offer, uh, academic resources, published resources, but business resources as well. And to get those business resources, you can't just ask for them. You have to earn it. And you, you earn it by delivering to it. And so our challenge is really to attract business in its own self-interest to both physically co-locate with us, but also virtually engage with us in order that they can get something from that association. And in return, what we will get is insights that those businesses generate back into our research and our teaching. Insights and capability back into our research and teaching. So when it comes to the precinct, which is the, the physical embodiment of that engagement, um, what we need to do is create an environment in which it is compelling for a business to be physically co-located with the institution for all sorts of reasons, not just because of what we can deliver them in terms of uh, a research outcome or uh, a student recruitment or uh, an environment in which to work, but all of the above. Uh, so we need to create an environment which is conducive to business doing business. And if we can be a part of that and we can facilitate that, uh, and create that sort of welcoming environment, it will serve us very well. So our job in terms of working the precinct through initiatives like the Monash Precinct Network and others is to create that sense of belonging to a broader ecosystem that is mutually reinforcing so that as each new entrant comes into the precinct, it makes the precinct that much more attractive for the next. And if we can get that dynamic working, it will self-generate and everyone within the precinct will benefit. So from a governance point of view, it's all about paying it forward rather than looking for the immediate return and recognising that it'll be the, the presence and the activity of those of those players within our precinct that ultimately will deliver us dividends without having to pay you know overly too much attention to the short-term returns that one might get through those partnerships so it's a long game for us um, and it's one where we recognize that the activity density will of itself generate returns for us because of the diversity of what it is we do as an institution so we're actively seeking to attract uh, businesses to co-locate within our precinct that have the greatest benefit from the activity that's already here, building on that critical mass. Um, so that's the approach we're taking, but we're constantly looking for new models. We're constantly looking to learn. Um, just talking over lunch today, um, there are some interesting ideas about how we might be able to do that more effectively, and, and that's our job, to continue to explore how best to attract businesses here. Do you think, Julie, or would you like to share with us some of the models that you've seen in other innovation districts that uh, here in the Melbourne ecosystem, in the Monash Technology Precinct, that we should be, should be looking to borrow 
and, mm -hmm. and learn from and uh, something that we can look to implement here for greater success? Well, there's you know several models that I continue to go back to that <clears throat> interestingly stem from how they're organized because the organization is ultimately how they can be greater partners to those in the community, to residents. And so I look at, for instance, in the US, for the United States, where often the state governments haven't been actively involved. And so it required them to understand how do we carve out our own future where we may not be getting the kind of revenue that we may need from the very beginning. So it was essentially a tremendous amount of work sitting at the table with a set of soon-to-be champions to carve out a future together. Conversations, right? Just starting with very simple conversations about what's not working. Why is it that we're teaching such brilliant students and then they leave? Why is it that our land actually is not creating the startups and why are they going to different places such as Silicon Valley and Boston? Why are they leaving us? How do we create our own ecosystem is a common one. And it ultimately comes down to these actors coming together and saying, we're going to invest together. Often it is jointly putting money. It's not just a university. It's others coming in and saying, we're all going to put an investment together and with that investment, achieve a different kind of multiple sort of growth scenario. But that means, for example, looking at the land, looking at the land collectively, irrespective of who's the owner, this is what's happened in Cortex. This is what's happened in Buffalo. This is now what's happening in Amsterdam. This is what we're looking at in Sheffield in the UK. Like understanding different landowners and saying, what if you don't look at it that way for a minute and you look at it as a place to grow people? What if we then think how to generate a portion of that, to generate revenue and take a portion of that that then is used to help finance placemaking, programmatic, equitable growth, cross-cutting objectives that often one actor can't do or should not be doing. So starting from the beginning, how you're organizing, to me, continues to be one of the most important pieces of yeah. this story. Yeah. You know, Another piece, and then I'll, I'll close here, is this focus on equitable growth. There are some districts that actually have now decided that's their central proposition, which is quite interesting, right? Because there are many focusing on R&D, and now they're saying, okay, wait a minute. If this could be considered our Achilles heel, if it could, how do we make this part of the center of our desk? Looking at land differently, looking at talent growth differently, and figuring out, can we then get new kinds of investors, impact-oriented investors, to come in and contribute to the story? This is something that's very much evolving right now, and it's something that we are paying particular attention to. Yeah. Julie just mentioned talent growth, yeah. Duron, yeah. and thinking about your portfolio of enterprise engagement and spanning across the, across the university. Uh, can you touch on some of the... Uh, the insight that you're gathering from firms and their talent needs and are they looking to innovation districts as a, as a way of, um, in a holistic way, meeting their talent needs and talent requirements? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so it's interesting. So, so uh, our portfolio has a, a principal focus uh, in terms of working with um, uh, larger corporations, partners for the university, we call them key or strategic accounts. And interestingly, no matter who you talk to of any significant organisation, and frankly, any organisation, but particularly the larger ones, and you, and you say to them, rather than, you know, will you fund our research into AI or will you fund our cyber security uh, infrastructure, which is all perfectly valid, um, if you simply ask them, what problems are you interested in solving? Pretty much first, at least first, if not second on their list, one or the other is going to be talent. We are in a constant battle for talent and we need 
the best talent we can find. So if we're interested in building a relationship with the university, we're interested in talent. That's number one. Number two is, is, is typically we have so many thousand employees today, we want to continuously upskill them. They want a continuous learning environment. How do we create that for our staff? And then finally, they, would, they, will, they will come to, and we're interested in new ideas. New ideas that can help us run our business more effectively. So that gets them into the innovation piece. Now, people might think that the first thing they'll think of is innovation. Well, no, it isn't. Uh, not really. It's talent. It's people. They want the best people. And so, uh, as, a, as a, a research and teaching institution, we are the best place of any entity out there to address those strongest needs of any company we care to talk to. Historically, though, um, they haven't viewed um, the universities as entities with, with whom they wish to partner in a systematic, holistic way. Um, they may take graduates from certain schools as a, as a matter of course uh, if they're in sort of uh, designated professions. But generally speaking, outside of the uh, somewhat regulated professions, the medicine and law, etc., more general uh, recruitment, the universities are not systematically engaged as partners with larger corporations, um, certainly not in this country. Uh, it's an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for us to carve out value uh, because by delivering that value, you create a relationship. Once you have a relationship, they move up Maslow's pyramid, right? So if you think at the baseline, they must get talent. Well, before I have talent, it's like eating. And unless I'm eating, I don't care about anything else. Then I need shelter. Okay, so I want to train my existing staff. Until I've got food and shelter, I don't, I don't, there's nothing else I can think about. But once you've got the basics in place, then you can start thinking about new ideas. How can I live better? Yeah, how can I do something with my time other than just find food and shelter? Uh, and I think that's where we want to go. We want to get relationships that will move up the pyramid. And uh, our opportunity is to do that by embracing the needs of our partners out there, but starting with what they need. Um, and and, and this, this, is a, this is counterintuitive, actually, within our space. Um, we're used to applying for grants and asking for money and getting the money and then doing our research and doing what we do. Uh, it's counterintuitive to start with, well, what do you need? How can we provide you with what you need? But I think if we start doing that, we will build the relationships that will underpin partnerships that will then start to self-generate within this ecosystem. And uh, the, a good example of a, of a, a work in progress is Moderna. So you'll, you'll probably all be familiar with the fact that Moderna is setting up a manufacturing facility here. A manufacturing facility does not stand alone. No one puts a manufacturing facility in the Simpson Desert. Why? There's no way you can run a manufacturing business because it doesn't stand alone. You need supporting industries. And when they start up here, why did they pick here? The Australian government gave them a $2 billion order. They could have set up anywhere. Why here? Because they want talent. They want to train their existing people. They want access to the new ideas. They want to be where the action is so that it will provides a sucker for their business as well. So it's a natural choice for them to be where there is value to be extracted beyond what their business can generate by itself. So we've doubled down on that and we said, okay, so you're here. What else can we do to fill the gaps that are not currently filled within this ecosystem to make it even more attractive for you to be here? And they said, well, there's some training aspects. Your graduates are not ready to put straight into a manufacturing facility that's making mRNA vaccines. What additional training is needed in GMP and drug development and various other, various other factors? So we sit with them and we understand the gaps in the marketplace and we designed a training centre focused on elements that would take them from where they are today to provide them with a conduit for regular supply of high quality, well-trained professionals. 
that's going to take time to build. They're making an investment with us and the Victorian government recognises the opportunity to fill the gap and they're investing in setting up that centre as well. So we have the manufacturing facility, then we have a training centre. Now there'll be other pieces of the ecosystem that will either be missing or sub subscale, which will need to be built up. We'll focus on that systematically. Over the five, ten year period, we will have the complete drug development ecosystem because of those catalytic moves that get us started, fill in the gaps. And once you've filled in the gaps, you become a destination, a desirable destination for all of the players that want to play in that space. Uh, I'll give you another example from uh, uh, the Israeli example in semiconductors. Uh, in, the, uh, in the 1970s, right, there was no semiconductor industry in Israel, nothing, zero. There was one man, his name was Dov Froman, and he was the inventor of the EEPROM, which is a fundamental building block of modern computers. He did that in Silicon Valley with Intel as an engineer, as a senior engineer. He decided he wanted to go home to live in Israel. Uh, he'd had enough of, uh, of the US for whatever reason, doesn't matter. And, uh, and he went back to Israel, but they said, well, you can't go. You can't leave the company. And he said, well, I'm going. So they said, well, then we're coming with you. <laughs> So, so they set up a, a, a research center in Haifa uh, for him. And then he said, I have a problem. He said, what's the problem? He says, no one here understands anything about semiconductors. Uh, who do I hire? <laughs> so he went to the Technion and he set up a course, which he ran on semiconductor physics. 10 years later, Intel, had to make some decisions around where they would put the first fab that they were going to build outside of North America. And there were many countries vying for that, uh, that option, including Australia, as it turned out. Um, but to cut a long story short, they decided to put it in Israel of all places. Right, which is not uh, an intuitive decision, right? We all know what's going on in Israel and would you invest billions of dollars in a fab in the middle of Israel in the 80s? It wouldn't have been my first choice, but because he'd been training so many semiconductor engineers over that intervening period, he had created a very pull factor that they needed. The government of Israel recognised that there was an opportunity and they doubled down and they supported Intel setting up a fab. They built that fab, but when you build a fab, you have to build a lot of supporting industries, special laundries. Why laundry? Because they're running clean rooms and a normal laundry won't clean the gowns clean enough. They'll still have little lints on them. So you've got specialised laundries have to be built in order to clean the gowns that they wear in the, in, the, in the clean room and so and so and so. By the time Intel had finished building the fab and all the supporting industries had been built, Motorola, National Semiconductor, said, well, they've got all the infrastructure in Israel. We'll put a fab there. So by the end of the 80s, Israel had a semiconductor industry, right, that was seeded by that one plant that built the infrastructure that then attracted more infrastructure. So we can all learn from the experience of others. We don't have to figure it all out for ourselves. It worked. It needed the coalition of government. It needed the private investor. It needed the nucleus of the opportunity. But when you've got that nucleus and it's right, and someone makes that, that decision, it triggers a whole lot of other possibilities. So Moderna is our intel. We can build around that, provided we understand how to fill all the gaps, provided the government is on side and can, has the vision, and we can build all the transport and all the other pieces necessary in order to leverage that and develop a drug development ecosystem that's world class. That's our potential. So, so there's a lot that has to go into it. It's a long game, as I said before, um, but you've got to recognise your opportunities and then build around it uh, because nature will take its course if you get the settings right. Thank you, John. That's a fantastic story. You know, uh, the Israel story really gives us something to look at um, for our Moderna mm. opportunity. Uh, Julie, Duran at the, at the end just mentioned transport. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have Vanessa here from the Suburban Rail Loop and Joseph here from Vicinity, who's working with Monash on the uh, Tractors Rapid Transport System, two major uh, transport initiatives uh, coming into uh, the Monash precinct. 
Can you share with us some of uh, your findings and examples where you've seen um, significant investment in transport infrastructure into other innovation districts? And what have been some of the building blocks that have been put in place to successfully use that investment to catalyze uh, inward investment from uh, private sector, uh, mm -hmm. other research institutions and government? Yeah, and I, I have to draw on a few other examples also outside of innovation districts just because they're so relevant here. So I think the infusion of public transport that you're about to experience is a tremendous catalyst for growth here. I mean, it, it really is fortuitous because there's a number of innovation districts that would do just about anything to have this investment at their doorstep. They have been fighting for decades to have that kind of high level public transportation that will create the opportunity for a much diverse audience, a much diverse talent pool to come into their district. Then the question is, how do you leverage that, right? So in the best of scenarios, it may mean that you need to then relook at the land around there most likely increase the density, and I know density, that term, is a scary term for many, but finding that right balance of what that means, more than a single floor, what could that be? Um, and then thinking about the diversity of uses. Importantly, that ground floor should be something that everyone feels they own and can access, irrespective. But then what happens up? Now, do you have this suburban rail loop that's going to have multiple stops? One could argue that you would treat those stops the same if you're thinking about it from an investment view and or an intervention view. But I would argue that the location of these stops here need to be treated differently. You are creating an ecosystem, which is a delicate balance of very different types of actors that are trying to solve very complex problems. And in their scenario, yes, it's access to talent, but it's trying to figure out and how to wrestle with some things that are not simple. You need to have those around you that are complementary, so have a different view, or have very similar views. So your buildings are your, is your ecosystem. And so if you come in with the view of anyone can go there, you just need to fill, then you have missed the point entirely. And so these particular geographies within walking distance around these stops need to be places for people to live and a set of actors that will be contributing to your very specific ecosystem, right? And so what you could find, and I'm just gonna put this right out there and make it very transparent. What you can find is that those that have the land may be wanting to just fill that very easily with a set of tenants because they're right there. Those easy wins of tenants is not the right answer. And this is something that's worth fighting for. Because if you then fill it, instead will take longer, but fill it with core actors that are contributing to your ecosystem, something's changing. So this is where you'll have attention. It will be coming, and I would argue, if I look at other examples, how do you create a partnership early around that land and who's managing the tenancy of that land to ensure that you're building something that's very complementary to the eco ecosystem that you're spending so much energy on creating. So great resource, also potential threat if you're not careful. So I, I stopped there. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Before I throw it open to some Q&A, um, Daron, how would you like to leverage the investment that's coming in uh, into the precinct through the multiple um, transport, uh, mass transport um, initiatives that have been invested in by state government and federal government? Yeah, look, I, I just want to echo uh, uh, Julie's comments there. I think um, being selective about who you have co-locate is really important because we do have quite a bit of land around Monash right now and we have been actively acquiring, um, but um, 
there's only so much land immediately around the around the campus so we've got to be very careful who we bring in and and make sure they are complementary to the ecosystem in terms of the mass transit um, <clears throat> if you read the uh, the report, uh, the livable, the livable metropolis report that we've we've just um, been discussing. It's critically important that there are very effective transport mechanisms from the major CBD to the intermediary city. Um, that integration is fundamental to the intermediate city being successful. Um, and of course, the ecosystem that you uh, sort of carefully craft uh, needs to be facilitated and transport is a fundamental and, and mobility in general is a fundamental piece of that puzzle. So the, the SRL stops within the precinct are vital, um, uh, but they are not sufficient by themselves. We need to leverage off them. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that the mobility around them is also facilitated uh, so that we energise the precinct optimally. Um, and uh, that's a challenge for all of us to work together on. Um, but um, it's a very exciting opportunity because it's, 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 uh, it's once in a lifetime, at least once in a generation, that you get the opportunity to, to craft this sort of, this sort of infrastructure. So uh, I think it's, it's a fundamental ingredient to making the precinct work. Um, and that combined with careful curation of who physically uh, resides here and what infrastructure we build around those those um, transport hubs is going to be the, the the mark of our success in the future. So it's a it's a great time to be planning and and, and thinking about these problems together. Thank you. And for those districts that have been trying for decades, Julia, we uh, we tried here for decades, so it, it was not an, it was not an overnight uh, success. And many people who have been alumni at, uh, or graduates of Monash University know uh, some of the challenges of uh, getting in and out of uh, in and out of this uh, in and out of this campus. So, I welcome any uh, any questions um, from our from our audience today. I think Beck's got a mic, uh, roving mic. So, if you just um, uh, I've got, got a question here. Just say who, who you are and where you're from um, and then, then ask a the question. That would be great. Thank you. So my name is Maya and I work in Career Connect here at Monash University and I'm interested in the uh, part of the talk about training skills. So um, organisations like you mentioned, like Moderna, would, would be attracted by the opportunity for professional training of talent, but most universities would have a teaching curriculum, they don't have professional training. And so I'd be interested in your thoughts of how you could meet needs such as Moderna or such as the modern version of the uh, company in Israel you mentioned uh, in terms of would you see professional training as alongside the curriculum, within the curriculum? considering that it would be companies like Moderna dictating what learning outcomes they would need and what kind of teaching facilities they would need, or after the curriculum, so an add-on to the curriculum. So what are the processes you see in Monash University to provide that professional training that's seen as critical for these innovation precincts? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, we're, we're actually walking down that path right now uh, with exactly those questions. Um, so the mRNA Medicine Manufacturing and Workforce Training Centre, which I'm amazed I got it out in one hit there, um, the centre <laughs> is being developed uh, right now, um, not just for Moderna, um, it's being developed for the mRNA space in general um, and the approach we're taking is uh, a very uh, sort of systematic methodical one. We're, we're working with a number of industry participants as well as the regulator. So with the TGA, with industry participants, with industry associations um, to get as broad a stakeholder coverage in terms of what our curriculum development looks like. Uh, will be. Um, clearly there is an immediate requirement uh, from Moderna, but there isn't only a requirement from Moderna. So for example, CSL is, is on our uh, advisory group and they have needs and they are identifying for us needs of their own and of the industry 
that are not currently met by our curriculum. And so we're designing the center to complement uh, the curriculum. Um, whether in the end uh, some of the elements of, of the centre are I I included within curriculum or whether it's entirely postgraduate, we'll see how it evolves over time. But we're not ruling anything in or out at this point. What we're trying to do is identify firstly the gaps between where our graduates come out with what skills they come out with and what do they need in order to be able to move into some of these um, uh, drug development and manufacturing businesses, um, particularly in the mRNA space, which is a relatively rarefied within the broader drug development context. So that's a piece of work going on right now. Um, and uh, thankfully, we've been supported by the state government in, in doing that work. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, within a few months' time, we will have our first courses defined. And I can more specifically answer your question. Um, could, I, could I add on to that? Please. So one, another way to sort of lift up and sort of look across a range of innovation districts and precincts on this point is that if there was a focus, right, as an innovation precinct beyond just the university, but a set of organizations that are thinking about how to grow talent, have it be local grown talent and keep that talent here, right, this is a proposition that arguably could and should be shared, right? So imagine if you had a network of organizations, including the university, but including industry and those that are thinking about workforce training, and also positions that you have where you have a very fine-grained understanding about specific things that are working that are not. And there's a set of conversations to be had to design a system, right? And it can be through a network, right? Where you have many districts have created networks, where you have Companies paying in, and the reason for that is because it takes a lot of time to do it well. Imagine if a network is organized around being ultimately some kind of talent growth intermediary. We're talking about intermediary cities. What if you think about this concept as being an intermediary of creating some kind of entity, thinking about how to create that right kind of exchange that's beyond just, let's say, biomedical and pharma, but also in the social sciences and in law and legal, in history, and how can those really different kinds of disciplines being used and applied in the industries that are right adjacent or a part of the precinct, all of a sudden your value proposition has just dramatically changed. And your relationships with each other, how you support and give each other that kind of input, changes. It's something that can start in small scale and then grow, but there is a proposition here about how to use this concept to grow local talent. Some are trying with communities, others are trying with students. I think that is an opening here for Manesh and for others to be thinking about how can you create an organizational way of growing your proposition. See, I keep going back to how you're organized. Mm. It just comes back to that. Yeah. Is there any um, particular districts that have done a fantastic job at organizing themselves that we should be looking at? So they organize, organize themselves very differently. If you take um, the example of University City District in Philadelphia, they actually organize themselves around workforce development and training and have now become a national model. But the only way they did that is because they did, well, just like what you were saying, they asked industry, where are the gaps? They said it's in talent, and then they looked at their community disadvantaged, not having enough access, and they created an entirely new set of programs of growing talent, placing talent, mentoring talent, supporting talent, not leaving, <laughs> right? Not just starting and then leaving, but continuing this pipeline. Mm. And that's one example of how they organize themselves. Their whole governance is structured around that.
That's where Cortex now is going. Cortex Innovation Community had figured out, okay, we're going to figure out how we're redeveloping the land using those financing to finance programs. Now they're realizing we need to be thinking about the workforce development piece. And so now they're sort of thinking around how do we then start to become the intermediary around that in a way that's supportive. They couldn't do it alone. They need to draw on people and organizations that have a strong grasp of very important nuanced elements of it, but collectively they're organizing a new future. So that's why the, the organizational piece, the brain, right, is, is the way that you figure out how are you actually going to move up the value chain and that really does mean growing your talent and it's a diversity of talent women minorities front and center to that story anyway yeah another question here uh liton kamrujaman from uh department of architecture at mada um my Question is in relation to the comment that Doroni made about who will we choose to bring in. I think that's uh, in a sense conflicting with what uh, Julie mentioned at the beginning about the organic development. So industry will choose location based on their utility maximization things. And if you look at the economic geographic principle, we need to develop that agglomeration thing. And agglomeration happens only when they, they see the benefit of interdependencies. So by intervening who will bring here, that will ultimately impact the kind of agglomeration that we are aiming to have here. So um, do you have any clarification on that? Or if I misunderstood your comment? Yeah, you, perhaps you slightly misunderstood my comment, but I firstly, I agree with you. <laughs> I, I, the, the, the best thing you can do is create the settings so that nature takes its course in the direction you want it to. So you do want the uh, companies, in a sense, to self-select into the ecosystem because the ecosystem is where they're going to thrive. So they're coming there for a reason. So where I say, where, where I'm talking about being selective, it's more about being selective in terms of the, the, um, the context that you project. So for, to, to be a simple example, um, if we wanted to, to create a, um, a, a very successful drug development ecosystem, we would be signalling to all those players within that sector, this is the place to be. They'll individually decide who comes where and pays what rent for what place and so forth. Um, but we will be making very strong signals that those are the sorts of companies that are going to benefit most from being here. That doesn't mean we individually select each one. Where it's our land and our building, perhaps we have more of a role in that regard. Uh, but um, uh, the, the, the point is that you're trying to create context which is conducive and then let nature take its course. Um, uh, and, you know, because Monash is the scale that it's at, it won't just be one sector. It won't just be drug development. I mean, the whole transport sector is very, very strong for us, for example. And with the SRL coming in, the opportunity for us to leverage the fact that we're going to have the largest infrastructure project the state has ever seen on our doorstep what can we make of that by way of ecosystem construction that will then be conducive to the further development of this precinct? Another massive opportunity in, you know, in our view. So, so there's, there's a lot to think about, but to your very precise question, it's not simply a matter of us selecting, it's more about creating context to attract. I actually would like to add a little bit more because as a research institute, what we have been doing is dissecting the R&D strengths of these places. We're actually looking at 23 different places and I'll take, let me take Amsterdam and let's take Monash, right? We're literally going down into the weeds and understanding the very specific 
not just fields of science where you excel, but the very specific disciplines and the intersection of those disciplines and the extent to which they're highly convergent, mixing, or they're very much focused within one very specific discipline and they're actually not wanting and, ex and wanting to engage in other disciplines because the work they're doing is just so specific. So we're, we're down in those weeds because we're trying to understand how the ecosystem is behaving. Right, so we have maps and maps and maps. I wish I could just show maps. All around the room, you'd see these incredible stories about who is talking to whom and how they're learning and how they're connecting and who is not. And that kind of information, I think, is extremely helpful when you're thinking about your ecosystem. Because I actually started talking about intentionality, right? And saying, so yes, you want to have an agglomeration effect, but wouldn't it be interesting if when we understand that the thing that makes this one district in Amsterdam so unique is that they have figured out through all of the collection of their actors how the drug moves through the body how the drug moves through the body, all of a sudden it starts to trigger a set of connections with different firms that otherwise would not have known this. That sends a different radar versus another district that actually can be deciding how drugs can be created differently with less adverse effects. Okay, here's this story. Oh my gosh, you've now just created an entirely different narrative of all the different startups and small firms and medium enterprises that may want to actually move into this space because there are very sophisticated thinkers in this ecosystem. So we we actually go down into the fine, into the weeds to understand that kind of a narrative as a way to sort of push and promote. Maybe these are the kinds of conversations that you want to have because it makes you so uniquely different than not just someone down the street or even in another part of Melbourne, but actually globally. And isn't that interesting? So there is a bit of organic and intentional, but the intentionality piece is still there and I think that's okay because you are still valuing diversity and agglomeration looking across sector but to be precise on these things I think is smart well thank you I think we have time for one more question Graham uh, Graham Curry Faculty of Engineering yeah uh, Doran sorry to pick on you mate but uh... <laughs> <laughs> the Commission is deliberately not just self-serving looking at Monash Technology pre pre uh, Precinct. It's deliberately looked around the world. It's got some great principles for and learnings for us. And I was wondering about that. You know, what, what do you see as the learnings from what the Commissioners have done that maybe their recommendations that maybe were quite a surprise for us or that are kind of a useful uh, contribution to what we're trying to do in the precinct that might have been, you know, not what we were doing. You know, did they come up with things that we, we should really have spent some time on? What were those sort of learnings that were useful for us? Well, I think the the commission was very helpful in illustrating different kinds of models of the way in which these intermediate cities can develop and the networks between them. So the way in which they interconnect. Um, that that was interesting, uh, for, for certainly from my perspective, in terms of the way they've evolved and, and been, in a sense, constructed. Um, that networking effect, so whether you know, have linear, uh, linear intermediate cities between two major cities, whether you have a networking uh, around a central city, I thought that was instructive. And you can definitely see where, uh, in the case of this particular precinct, we would fit that modelling versus maybe not fitting other other uh, options. So that was instructive. I think, look, the, w were there any surprises? It's hard to say because it was a gradual process and I was constantly reading drafts, so I don't know at what point I was surprised. Um, uh, it's, I sort of, I sort of grew, grew with it. <laughs> so it's not like I got to the end and went, oh, I never thought that. Um, uh, but but I think uh, I think what it, what the what the commission has done is it's brought very different examples and brought them together so that you can see that there isn't just a one answer here. Uh, this is, this is not a uh, uh, solve for X. Uh, this is very much a case of understand your context. Uh, 
and then learn from what has succeeded in similar contexts. And to me, that's the main uh, learning from the report. It brings all that together and enables a discussion that is in context. And uh, we, 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 we make the mistake too often of reinventing every wheel. There's a lot to learn from others. Uh, make sure we do, but then recognise that having learnt from others, there will be unique characteristics in the Monash precinct, which means our solution will be yet another example that will be different, but we will have incorporated the learnings from all those other examples that were in the report. That's that's the, the main message for me. Um, and uh, uh, I think having all that in one place is very helpful. So I, I'd love to put then that commissioner hat on because we've been talking about innovation districts, right, a smaller geography. And the commission really was focused on a larger construct, a regional construct, which is around a set of networked cities, right? It's not a focus of a one major megatropolis, it's actually looking at a network of cities across a region in a much more sustainable, equitable, distributed way. Achieving new outcomes that cannot be achieved when you have sort of this one sort of relationship with one megapole, right? That was really the, the construct of the commission. And it was really quite interesting because we did had this conversation in the midst of the pandemic. And it was the very pandemic itself that also prompted and facilitated a further discourse on the need for intermediary cities. Because what you found, right, naturally, is you're seeing people are now working at home and they're seeing new value and benefits from a livable perspective, which are creating tremendous new trends and preferences that are dramatically drawing new lines on our economic, physical, and social landscape. So here was this, in the middle of all of this, a conversation that actually is serving an interest that is unfolding before our very eyes. People wanting to have a different future for themselves that may not be how it was currently constructed before that pushed them to move in one direction to a city and back again, but rather an interlacing of multiple cities, smaller cities, connected cities that are thinking about how to be more nimble, more inclusive, and from a governance view, being thinking through what does that mean to be more responsive and capable around what's happening much more locally around them. It's just I think if it's an, I, there's a term for having to actually have an exercise in the midst of a grander exercise. And that's what this commission was really set out to do. And so now, I think what we're seeing is that people are not returning to the office in the same way. It, they have. Whether we want to agree with them or not, they are redrawing the lines before us about what our regions should look like and how they people should be interacting. This paper, to me, is a response, an interesting response to that phenomenon. And so tomorrow, we'll hear from other members of the commission that could really speak to some, I think, important examples that can help Melbourne, other cities, other regions around the world. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Julie. Yeah. Is there any final comments you'd like to make, Duron? No, I think there have been some good questions. Uh, uh, happy to have further discussions in the break. I know you've all been sitting for a while. You probably want to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, uh, for your contribution and, and coming today. And Julie and Duron, uh, thank you for your, your insights. And Thanks, Ben. Uh, with us. I encourage you to, to follow the... Uh, the, the Twitter hashtags over the next few days um, so you can see the conversation uh, flowing through and hear what other commissions are saying about the about the report and um, download a copy of the report or share a copy of the link with your uh, with your colleagues and uh, keep the conversation going uh, in a broader sense around how we can best use this uh, wonderful resource uh, here in Victoria and here in Melbourne to uh, to drive good public policy uh, and investment decisions and program decisions around uh, using the knowledge that's been built up 
uh, to, the, to the best advantage for our community. So I ask you now to um, put your hands together to thank Julian Dron in the traditional way.